Man, it's just been so rich. So my goal today is just to put an exclamation point at the end of this week before, thankfully, we get Pastor Pat back next week. Come on, are we ready to hear a message from Pastor Pat next week? <laughs> Love you guys. So glad you've gotten some time off to rest. It's our uh, honor and our privilege to be able to step in for you while you do that. And so this week, uh, I want to talk to you about a topic called What's Your Mountain? What's Your Mountain? So 11 years ago or so, 10, 11 years ago, there was an app that launched uh, in the early days of social media called Vine. Does anybody remember the app that was called Vine? Yeah, I heard a few shouts over here. I used to love Vine, and it was really one of the first apps that was created uh, specifically just for video content. So you have no Instagram stories, no Reels, no TikTok. None of that exists today without this app that was called Vine First. And it was really genius because you could only create videos that lasted six seconds. That's it. So if you wanted to make compelling content, if you wanted to grab people's attention, you had to be very funny, very creative, very entertaining. Those limitations kind of forced you to be that way. And so there was a small group of young people when this app first launched that became known as Viners. And there was only about 50 of them. They all kind of figured out how to find each other and they gathered together in Los Angeles and they started making all these videos together and they were hilarious. I mean, when you're sitting in the airport, there was no better time to like burn a few hours while you're waiting on your airplane. Uh, I know I probably should be like reading a theology book or something, but I was on Vine <laughs> watching all that stuff. And um, it was cool because um, these people had just really figured out how, how to crack the code of this medium. They made really funny and compelling stuff. But I began to notice about a year or two after that app launched that something started making its way into this space. And you would begin to see people make videos that included name brand products. And so sometimes it would be like toothpaste or it would be a laundry detergent. Other times it might be just a particular brand of clothing or like a snack food, but they weren't making videos for these products. These products just started showing up in their videos. And what I began to realize is that these people weren't featuring these products just because they really liked them and wanted to get the word out about them. Now, these people were featuring these products in their videos because they had figured out how to make money featuring these things in their videos. See, brilliantly, large corporations and brands began to recognize that if they could pay these content creators to promote their products in the videos that they were already making, then they would have a much higher market reach. They'd have millions more eyeballs watching their stuff than just the traditional means of television ads or full page ads in a magazine. Their, their dollars would be stretched a lot farther. And so here was born a brand new category of commerce called influencing. We're all familiar with this word in 2024. We're all familiar with influencers, right? This is where it started. Vine was the thing that started this whole trend. And so these influencers found themselves in a space where their voices were heard and their faces were seen. And because of how many people were paying attention to them, they created an entirely new marketplace and culture. Almost overnight, influencers became the future of advertising around the world. Now it's one of the largest ways that advertisers sink budget into their, into their products is by connecting with influencers and having them feature their products. There are people who are making millions of dollars per year doing this. So while being a social media influencer is a relatively new phenomenon, probably less than 10 years, what's not new is the idea of going into a new space and influencing that space. The idea has been around for centuries. Take, for example, the ancient Greeks. Athens at the time would deploy an admiral with a fleet of ships and a specialized crew who would assist him on a very specific mission. The fleets would be sent out to sea for the purpose of locating territories where civilization was non-existent. And once that region was identified, the admiral, along with his crew, their cargo, all of their belongings, they would disembark and they would settle down and they would begin to establish a new community. At that point, they would begin the work of transforming this unfamiliar land into a clone of life as it was back in Athens. 
Their purpose was total colonization of this uncivilized territory. And this happened hundreds and hundreds of times. So much so, in fact, that these people, these admirals were given a title beyond that title. See, admiral was what they were when they just commanded a fleet in the Navy. But for this specialized commission, they became known as apostolos in the Greek. In ancient Rome, there were people like this as well. And this title, the variant of this title, meant an envoy sent to do business on behalf of the one who sent him. See, Caesar would impart authority for this ambassador to act uh, to represent his government to another government. Now, this person officially possessed the authority and the influence to speak in the place of the one who sent him. So when this ambassador spoke, it was as if the one who sent him was speaking. When this ambassador acted, it was as if the one who sent him was acting. The connection between the center, the sender and the person who sent him was inseparable. And here we come upon the Roman title given to this person. You may recognize this one. They were called apostles. They were called apostles. Now, like me not long ago, many of you might have thought that the word apostle was just Christianese or a churchy title that we give to just select few people. But it's actually not even a Christian word. It originated with the ancient Greeks and the Romans. Jesus, as he always did in his scriptural accounts, he taught within the context of the moment that he lived in, using phrases and terms that people would have been familiar with, people would have recognized and understood what they meant. So in Mark 3, verses 14 through 19, he starts out, it says, he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. And then the rest of that passage goes on to name the 12 disciples. Now, for these 12 disciples that we're all so familiar with, it was that moment that would have been a graduation of sorts for them, calling them to a higher rank in the kingdom structure. Just like the Greeks or the Romans had done, Christ was commissioning his apostles. He was sending them out. These followers of Jesus would have clearly understood what he meant by calling them apostles because they saw it firsthand. See, Rome had moved in to Jewish territories and were occupying the territories at this time. They established Roman civilization with their Roman social structures, their Roman values. They brought all of that with them, their way of life, their business models, their religions. In Matthew's account, chapter 10, verse seven and eight, their commissioning, these 12, was recorded this way when Jesus said, and as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. Freely you have received, so freely you give. When Jesus sent them out, no longer disciples, now apostles, his orders were quite literally, step into the world and bring the kingdom with you. They now possessed the authority to act as he would act and to speak as he would speak. They moved from students and learners to messengers and influencers. He promoted them from apprentice to masters, from admirals to apostles. Church, one thing that we must come to understand very clearly is that the way by which God has always envisioned that his creation would turn back to its natural order is through us, those who are sent. See, apostle is not a title reserved for only the most elect and only the most special among the Christian family. Apostle is a title given to somebody who is sent to bring culture into a place that needs culture, that needs kingdom culture. So what the message is today, the simple message is this, the way that we save this fractured and decaying world that we live in is by us, God's people, stepping into it and bringing the kingdom with us. Amen. We have to step into the spaces that need God the most and bring him with us. So what does that look like for us? Do we stand on street corners with signs aimed at sinners that say turn or burn? 
I don't think that's the way. Burkhart, that's not the way. Do we post cheesy Christian memes on Facebook that are poorly disguised as judgment instead of ministering reconciliation? Do we bludgeon people with scripture like a hammer? Or do we facilitate environments where the healing scalpel of the Holy Spirit can begin to do heart surgery on broken people? What do we do? What does it take to step into the world and bring the kingdom along? Some of you may be familiar with the concept of the seven mountains of influence. I'm not really sure where it started. I know there's been books written on this topic. I know sermons have been preached. There's been TED Talks given, but there's this idea that there are seven primary spheres of influence in any given culture that makes up a nation. Seven primary spheres of influence. And those spheres are business, media, arts and entertainment, education, government, family, and religion. Now, those are the broad categories. Those are the big umbrellas, if you will. They're subsets underneath every one of these. But if you boil it down to its simplest form, everything that makes up a culture of a nation comes down to these seven things. So what's it, what's it look like to step into these places and bring the kingdom with you? Well, part of what it looks like is in the world of business. There's a guy by the name of Mark Russell who wrote a book called The Missional Entrepreneur. And in this book, he explores the intersection between business and missions work which are not two things that are commonly associated, right? We tend to think of missions work as something that is just done altruistically, just out of the goodness of our heart going and, and doing something to, to convert people to Christianity, right? But what his concept is, is that he's, he's advocating for a new paradigm where the primary goal is to bless communities rather than to focus solely on converting them to Christianity, See, he tells stories about business ventures that are designed with this dual purpose, to be profitable, yes, but to serve as a blessing to the communities that they operate in. In one of the most poignant sections of this book, he describes that focusing on conversion as the primary objective can lead to a transactional and sometimes manipulative approach to relationships. See, people can always smell it out when you have an alternative agenda, they can always sniff it out. They can feel it. And even if it's a good thing, even if your agenda is to bring them to Christ, if they don't feel like you're being honest with that up front, it'll turn them off. And so his contention is that when you establish a culture of blessing, blessing people just to bless them, where the entrepreneur's primary aim is to contribute positively to the community's well-being, irrespective of the consequences, whether they convert or not, blessing just to bless, this shift in focus builds trust and respect between the entrepreneur and the community, laying a foundation for deeper and more meaningful connections. He gives some pretty astounding results. He launched this model in Thailand and he set up two groups of people. He set up uh, entrepreneurs that would go in with the stated specific purpose to convert people to Christianity. And he set up another group with the stated explicit purpose just to bless the community in which they were planning the business. And for the conversion-focused businesses, they saw one in 10 people come to Jesus, one in 10. Now, that's 10%. Listen, if one in 10 people that I come across or impact actually turns and meets Christ, those aren't bad numbers, right? I think we'd all be pretty happy with that. You would hope for more, but one in 10 is not bad. The blessing-focused businesses saw 48% conversion rate almost five times as much as those who went in just to convert people to Christianity. And so the impact of this approach is clear. Businesses that focused on blessing the community rather than seeking conversions saw nearly a five times higher conversion rate than those primarily aimed to convert. By reframing this mission from conversion to blessing, Russell believes that these missional entrepreneurs are embodying the teaching of Jesus in a way that aligns with the broader concept of the kingdom of God, where the goal is justice and mercy and love rather than just merely increasing numbers. See, Jesus tells us in Matthew's gospel that every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree cannot bear good fruit, or sorry, a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. 
Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. But here is the key. Verse 20. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. See, blessing people and loving people and showing kindness and mercy to people bears good fruit because you're not just telling people about Jesus, you're showing them what he looks like. And when you reach into these spaces, as, as Mark Russell did with these businesses, and you go in, hey, regardless of if you come to Christ or not, I'm still going to bless you. I'm still going to help you. I'm still going to do everything I can to make sure you experience the compassion and the love of Jesus. Five times more people came to know him. Maybe it bears asking the question within ourselves, do we care more about the number of converts or blessing those that need the conversion? Maybe we should just ask that question internally. And that's an example of something that happened in the business world, but what about some of these other spaces, some of these other mountains that we can occupy? What about arts and entertainment, right? Man, do we need some people to occupy arts and entertainment? Whew. Anybody see that opening ceremony the other night? So what happens when we have a vacuum where people don't take the kingdom into these spaces? Sean Bowles, who's a well-known prophetic voice in the community, uh, in the Christian community, he tells a story about a friend of his that worked as an animator at, uh, and a story editor at Disney Animation Studios in Los Angeles. And back in 2015, there was an effort to reintroduce a popular character, if not the most popular Disney character, as same-sex attracted. Now, these conversations had real momentum, and it looked like a foregone conclusion that when part two of this character story came out, they were going to reintroduce her as a lesbian. Now, some Christians who found themselves in this predicament would have organized picket lines, and they would have protested this decision. They would have created national headlines. Definitely not anybody in this room, not anybody at Burkhart, but some Christians would have but not Sean's friend. See, Sean's friend realized that she was a kingdom ambassador. Of course she was grieved. And of course she didn't wanna see this happen, but instead of doing all the things that she could have done, she began to just deeply seek God's wisdom in prayer for what she needed to do as a Jesus follower in this space. See, she didn't kick over tables or quit her job or put Disney on blast on social media. No, she understood the assignment that she was placed there as an apostle to have influence. And so she prayed. One day she walked into the creative meeting where the plan was to make this final decision about what to do with this character. And as she waited her turn to give an opinion, she listened as person after person after person advocated for changing this character. And it was when, when it was her turn to speak, she made one simple point. She said this, if we do this, we will be betraying our audience. She went on to explain that the character that they were toying with was no ordinary character in Disney's catalog. It was one of the most beloved characters in the organization's history. And to begin this person's story one way, only to pull the rug out from under the audience and change it fundamentally when part two of this story comes out, it would be a betrayal and the audience would lose trust in the brand. She recalled that there was a moment of silence and then the director was the first one to speak up. And he said, she's right. We can't do that to our audience. Friends, that movie was Frozen 2. That movie was Frozen 2 and it came out in 2019. It became the highest grossing Disney sequel and one of the highest grossing animated movies of all time. $1.45 billion at the box office. Now, I can imagine a scenario in which that was released and they had changed this character. How much money do you think that movie would have made? What kind of message would Disney have sent to people who didn't align with their message? There was no protest, no weaponized scripture references, no condemnation towards those people in that meeting that were far from God. She didn't quit and she didn't run and hide. Using prayer and wisdom and reason, she influenced the culture of that studio. She stepped into her world and she brought the kingdom with her. Amen. So let me ask you today, what's your mountain? What mountain do you need to occupy today? 
I recently had the opportunity uh, not long ago to step into a different part of my world and occupy the mountain of education. Last fall, through the encouragement of my wife and some good friends, I campaigned for a seat on the Tip City Board of Education and was fortunate enough to be one of three people elected to that position. And to say that I had no clue what I was getting myself into would be a gross understatement. (laughs) It's not to say that I regret it because I feel very privileged to serve my community, but I will tell you, I will tell you that in a town of just 11,000 people to see how politically divided that that even a town of 11,000 people can be, it gives me a greater understanding for a country of 340 million people. It's no mystery to me why we are where we are right now in this country. But here's, here's what I've learned over my life, that God's hand fits in the glove of human events. And God used specific people in my life, people that I knew heard from him, people that I trusted, people that I knew believed in me, he used them to approach me with this idea. And if you ever have a question about what the voice of the Holy Spirit sounds like, sometimes it sounds a lot like people who love you and are for you approaching you with a really uncomfortable idea. That's often how God will speak to you. It didn't take me too long to agree because I wasn't confident that I could do it, but other people who loved me and believed in me were confident that I could do it. And when I prayed about it, God showed me that with all of the chaos that exists, in public education in this country. To have the opportunity to step onto that mountain as a kingdom ambassador and make a difference was something I barely had to think twice about. And it wasn't just me, another one of our own right here at Living Word, Fred Garber, actually won a seat on the Board of Education in in Brookville as well. So now we have two Living Word representatives and kingdom ambassadors in the world of education. Come on. All glory to God. But he's not done yet. There are some of you that need to occupy that mountain. There's some of you that the Lord wants to put in positions of influence to help shape the future of education in this country. I can imagine a day when all over the Miami Valley, not just two school districts, but dozens have kingdom ambassadors and representatives. What do our schools look like in 10, 15 years if that happens? What does it look like? I'm sure Fred would say the same thing, but... I've already seen the difference it can make when you go into these spaces with the kingdom mentality. I can tell you that God's moving in these districts and he's working on people's hearts and the parents are coming around to a new normal, a new way of thinking, a new interesting idea about what education should be. Now, I'm not sharing this, please hear me. Like I said, I'm very privileged to be in a position to serve. So I'm not sharing this out of some form of, some form of self-promotion. What I'm telling you is that I am no different than anyone else in here. I'm no different than anyone else down at Burkhardt. I am not special. I am simply a servant to the king who made himself available. That's it. So it doesn't put me in a different category than any of you. I I am authorized to occupy any mountain that he puts me in front of, not because of what I can do, but because of what he can do through me. That's the point. So again, I ask, what's your mountain? What's your mountain? Some of us have a hard time getting past what we're not. Some of us have a hard time getting past, well, man, I I would love to step into a new space and do this thing, and I really feel called here, but I don't have this gifting, and I don't know those people, and I just, listen, my prayer for you today is that instead of feeling guilty for who you're not, that God would help you celebrate who you are and empower you with a boldness, empower you with the ability to wrap yourself in the robes of the kingdom and walk into these spaces on earth that are needed to bring light to the darkness, to be salt and light to the earth. Don't worry about what you're not. God can take care of that. He'll help you celebrate what you are. Listen, God doesn't need perfect. He needs available. God doesn't need perfect. He needs available. There's not one person in your Bible that God used that can claim the title of perfect. And even after he started using them, they couldn't claim the title perfect. In some ways, they messed up even worse as they were serving the king, but he recognized if their heart was after him, that's what he needed. 
if they had a heart that was chasing him, they had a heart that was bringing the kingdom to the spaces where it was needed most, he can work with that and he can use that. John Maxwell right now is taking the mountain of government by storm. He is influencing leaders of countries around the world and he's seen entire economies shift and cultures begin to flourish because he's using his platform to expand the kingdom. I was having this conversation with Pastor Pat a couple of weeks ago. All of these cultural and political and economic shifts that we're seeing right now in South America, where there's a return to common sense and democracy and prosperity, all of that is as a direct result of John Maxwell's influence on the leaders of those country. Too many Christians, though, take the opposite approach of John Maxwell. And sometimes we play into the division and the hatred that's running rampant in our country and politics right now. See, a lot of times Christians will step into the world, but they'll leave the kingdom in this building. They'll, they'll go out into the world, but they'll believe, well, church is for church. That's where I go to check my box and to feel good and to, and to do my thing and to check my, my religious duties for the week. But what we have to understand is Jesus called us to something greater to, than that. He took a title that would have been familiar to people that meant establishing culture, changing society, moving into spaces that currently didn't exist for the kingdom and making them exist for the kingdom, bringing the kingdom into the world with us. He took the term apostle and redeemed it for kingdom purposes. There's a well-known book by C.S. Lewis called The Screwtape Letters. Maybe some of you have read it or heard about it. But it was written as a satire originally, but also as a strong defense of the Christian faith. See, C.S. Lewis was a staunch atheist at one point in his life, and he got radically transformed in an encounter with Jesus. And so his mind worked in a very apologetic way. And so many of his books are a defense for Christianity because he, he worked his, most of his life to tear down Christianity to advocate against it and to dismantle it. And he realized that was a dead end road. And so when he had this transformation, a lot of his, a lot of his literature focused on apologetics and defending the faith. And in the screw tape letters, he wrote it as a, a series of 31 letters that was written in third person from uh, screw tape, who was a general demon in hell's army. So imagine somebody with a very high ranking position in an army, that was screw tape. And he had an apprentice named Wormwood, a demon in training, if you will. And each of these demons in training were assigned a human on earth. And they, their job was to continue leading them to the path of their ultimate destruction. The human beings in these stories were referred to as the patient. And in one of his letters, Screwtape writing to Wormwood, he talks specifically about politics. And he says this, my dear Wormwood, be sure the patient remains completely fixated on politics. Arguments, political gossip, and obsessing on the faults of people they have never met serves as an excellent distraction from advancing in personal virtue and character and the things the patient can control. Make sure that to keep the patient in a constant state of angst and frustration and general disdain towards the rest of the human race in order to avoid any kind of charity or inner peace from further developing. Ensure that the patient continues to believe that the problem is out there in the broken system rather than recognizing there's a problem within himself. Keep up the good work, Uncle Screwtape. That book was written in 1941, 83 years ago. And it shows you that times haven't changed a whole lot. Friends, there's mountains that we have to occupy all over the place. We have to occupy the mountain of family. We have to be a real person in front of our kids and share our failures with them. Now listen, if you want to impress somebody, share your successes. But if you wanna connect with somebody, talk about your failures. Listen, kids need help. Kids need help. They need to know you're not a screw up. You're not, we're not gonna abandon you just because you've made a mistake and because you're on the journey of trying to figure things out. They don't know what they don't know. So who's gonna tell them if you don't? 
How are they gonna connect with you if they think that you're some perfect version? Listen, every child goes through three phases. They idolize their parents, they demonize their parents, and then they humanize their parents. And so you start out as your child's idol. They look to you and they think that I could never be what mom or dad is. They're the greatest thing on earth. And then they get to a teenager and there comes the demonized phase. Am I right? I haven't experienced that yet, but God help, we're on our way. And then you get to the phase of life where you grow up and you maybe get married and you settle down a little bit and you have a family of your own. And then you look back at your parents and you say, man, they're human, just like I am. They probably did the best that they could with what they were given, but man, I had no right to hold that against them because they didn't know what they didn't know. That only happens if you will connect with your children and help them avoid the failures that you've made in your life. Have a strong, healthy marriage in front of your kids. That's one of the best things that you can possibly do. It's one of the best things that you can possibly do. And I'm very passionate about this next point. Make Christ real to your kids, not a cute cartoon character. Not a fanciful story of some far off person that doesn't interact with them on a daily basis. Listen, we have to understand that our kids need to know that there was a man that walked this earth that lived and died and was raised from the dead. And he did that so that you could live in eternity and not be forced to forever in hell because of what he did. And this was a real person who did this. And guess what? He's still available to you today. He's still here. He's still moving. One of the things that I've recently started doing is talking to my eight-year-old son about Jesus as if it was a great grandparent. Because listen, your kids will develop, even if they never met their grandparents or their great grandparents, they'll develop some sort of relationship with them. If you talk about them and you let them know these stories, well, grandpa, your great grandpa served in World War II. He was, a, he was a Navy medic and he was on a ship in the South Pacific and he sacrificed a lot to make sure that we live in our freedom and our safety today. That was your great grandfather. Now, what would happen if we spoke about Jesus this way to our kids? Woo. What would happen if we brought Jesus forward is that, listen, there was this time where Jesus was walking through a crowd and there's this woman that came, she was so desperate for healing and she touched the hem of his garment and he didn't even know where it went, but the power left his body and she was made whole on the spot. What would happen if we talked about him in that way and not, well, there's this Bible story about a short man in a tree and do you understand the difference that I'm saying? Make him real. Make him real to your kids. Help them develop a relationship with Jesus through you because through you, they're going to see what he looks like. Make him real to your family. Anybody remember those felt boards that they used to use in Sunday school? The little cutouts and you'd have a felt board and you'd stick Jesus on there and all the Bible characters. Man, let's get rid of felt board Jesus and give him the real thing. Let's give him the real thing. Live it in front of him. Let him see it in you. And the mountain of religion, listen, we don't have, this could be a series. We don't even have time for me to stop here for long. But we need to stop dividing the body of Christ over two pages in the Bible and start aligning on the other 1,200 that we agree on. There's so much more as the body of Christ and all these different denominations that exist. And don't get me wrong, some of them are beautiful expressions of faith. So I'm not coming down on denominations, but what I am saying is when denominations are used as a tool of division, it's counter gospel. It's not accomplishing what Jesus saw happening in this world. That is a body divided, not united. And really, I heard a, I heard a preacher say it this way one time that there's really about two pages of scripture that divide us into all of our different denominations. And we totally discount the 1,200 plus others that we all agree on. Christ says it this way in John 13, 34 and 35, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so must you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, my people, my church, my followers, if you love one another. Friends, he's talking to the church. He's talking to the church. If we don't love one another well, then why in the world would those who are lost wanna come into this family? 
Let me ask you if you've ever had this experience. Have you ever been invited over to somebody's house? Maybe it's a friend of yours. Maybe this happened when you were younger or more recently. And you sit down at the dinner table with them and their family. It's the first time you're meeting their family. And all of a sudden, they just start laying into each other. Man, arguments, fighting over politics, putting each other down, doing all these crazy things. And you're just sitting there cringing like, what is happening? Right? I've been in that situation. I know it's taken everything in me not to slide under that table and crawl out of the room. It's uncomfortable. Friends, this is what the world sees when the church fights over stupid issues. That's what the church experiences when the church can't, when we can't get our act together and we put everybody else down and we start casting judgment in the direction of those that we don't know or have never met. Wouldn't it be better if we could just occupy the mountain of religion and faith and come together in unity as one body globally and just see what God does in that spirit of unity. Just see when we can come together on all that we agree on and dismiss the things that we disagree and come together for the sake of Christ. Let's occupy the mountain of religion and faith. Listen, the point today is this, there is a mountain that you are supposed to occupy. There's a space that you're supposed to walk into and that you're supposed to influence. Burkhart, there are places you're meant to go as an apostle. It's not a title reserved for only the elect. It means one who is sent forth. Where do we start? What do we do? If you hear nothing else today, if you take nothing else away, where can we start? When you're on an airplane, and they're about to take off and they're doing the safety briefing. If you've ever paid attention to them, I know most of the time the AirPods are in, you're watching a movie, you're listening to music, I get it. But when they do these safety briefings, they mention in in one particular part, they say, in the event of cabin depressurization, an oxygen mask will be released from overhead. And the next line is what's important. They say, "Make make sure to securely fasten yours first before helping somebody else. And why do they say that? It's because if you have somebody that's traveling with you that's a dependent, whether it be a child or somebody who's infirmed or whatever the case might be, if you're not getting the oxygen that you need, you can't help them get their oxygen. So you put your oxygen mask on first and then you help them get theirs on. And why do we say this? Because we can't stand on top of the great mountains in this world until the mountains in your own life have been conquered. It's hard to help somebody else when you still have things that are unsettled in your life. It doesn't mean you can't. And again, it doesn't mean that you have to be perfect, but it does mean you can make it a lot harder on yourself and you can create obstacles that are unnecessary if you would have just settled the issues in your life first. So that fear that's hanging on to you, that shame, that guilt, the lust, the greed, the pride, whatever it is, we have to settle that within our hearts. We have to find healing. We have to find freedom. We have to find reconciliation. I know that's easier said than done. Believe me, I'm not standing up here trying to make this sound like that's an easy thing to do. I know there's some very deep seated things that take root in our lives. And sometimes when we just stop paying attention, that's when they can grow and they can flourish even more. But I I heard it said this way one time that David defeated Goliath, but lost to Bathsheba. Our real giants are the unhealthy desires we haven't killed yet. Make sure that you get the issues of your life settled so that we can occupy the mountains that God needs us to occupy, so we can influence the spaces that we need to influence, so we can be his apostles sent forth to bring kingdom culture everywhere that it's needed. I'd like to ask everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. Everything I've talked about today requires a great deal of personal reflection and prayer. And if this message stirred something in your soul, there's two possible responses. One, if you're already on the mountain that you're meant to occupy, ask the Holy Spirit to strengthen you and give you more land to increase your influence. There's a prayer of Jabez where it says, bless me, Lord, and increase my territory, increase my influence. Maybe that's your prayer today and you just need to expand your influence. Maybe you need to find that mountain that you're supposed to occupy, that space that you're supposed to go in and settle. Ask the Holy Spirit in this moment to highlight that to you. But maybe 
maybe you've never even encountered Jesus yet. Maybe all of this is not making much sense to you because you don't have the proper context for it and you haven't encountered the life-changing grace of Jesus Christ. And if that's you today, I just wanna simply offer you an opportunity to come to know him. In a moment, I'm gonna ask you just to raise your hand if that's you. If you felt something stirring on the inside of you during this message, if you felt something shifting, like you need to take some sort of step or some sort of action, friends, the first step is just to know Jesus and to encounter him. And so I wanna give you that opportunity today. He can wipe away your past and make everything clean and acceptable before God. He'll wash you white as snow. And all it takes is a simple declaration of, yes, Lord, that's me, I believe in you. I want forgiveness of my sins and I wanna follow you. If that's you today, would you just slip up your hand in this place? If you wanna make that step today, if you wanna encounter Jesus, thank you for that hand. Hands going up all over, thank you for that hand, thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. I see that hand, I see that hand. Several hands in the back. Two, three hands over here. Praise God, guys, there's hands up all over the place. Now listen, look up here at me for just a second. Those of you who just raised your hands, I promise you, you're about to make the best decision of your entire life. And it doesn't mean automatically that all your problems are fixed, but what it does mean is that Christ is going to, first of all, put within you a new heart. It's going to allow you to take off the blinders that maybe you've been wearing and see with clarity the world around you and how you fit in and the part that you play. But most importantly, it's gonna secure your place beside the king in eternity, where we get to live and celebrate and have joy and eat at the table of the king of the universe. It's the best decision you'll ever make. Living Word family, I want us to pray this all together and out loud down at Burkhart campus. You do the same. If you're there and you wanna to respond to this message in that way, Pastor Hank and his team are gonna be there to pray with you as well. But can we all lift our voices together as an encouragement to those who are praying this for the first time? Repeat after me, dear Jesus, I come to you today in need of forgiveness. I wanna know what it means to occupy the mountains in my life. But first, I need you to save me. I give you my life, I give you my sin, and I ask that you take it from me and turn me into who you want me to be. And I know I'll never be the same again. In Jesus' name I pray. Come on, church, can I get a good amen? amen. Come on, praise God, love you.